Welcome back to our next installment of Marketing Lessons from a Data Scientist. Um, this second session is focusing on the right data and it's called the right data gets the right, gets results. So we're gonna start talking here about uh, data in the context of signal and noise. And so when you're talking to um, data practitioners, a lot of times you'll talk about kind of signal to noise ratio and how much signal is in the data you're talking about. And, um, Kind of want to talk about what that signal is and how we can extract it and, and why it's important that we focus um, on having signal in our data. So I'll start off saying signal is not cleanliness. It, it's different from having clean data. It's not um, if all of the data has been uh, sanitized and, and clean and that kind of thing. Really what we're looking at is, is does the data that we have measure something um, that we're trying to uh, uh, about the outcome that we care about. So marketers drive outcomes, and we talked about that last time. Um, customers are purchasing, customers are churning, customers are, uh, you're acquiring new customers, they're registering, they're doing a lot of things, and you have kind of discrete outcomes, right, that you're trying to optimize. And if you have data that helps predict those outcomes, then you've got data with signal. But if you don't, then there's not a lot of signal in that data. So our data is gonna be a combination of signal and noise and making sure that we have the right signal in our data is going to be uh, really important for us. So that leads us to the question of how we do actually find signal. And I'll say that finding signal is very hard. Uh, data are inherently noisy. Uh, internal analysis from Lytics shows that of the data that customers are bringing into the platform, they only use about 9% of it, um, right? So most of the data that we have doesn't have a lot of signal in it. So focusing on the right data, bringing in the, the right data related to you know, the outcomes that we do uh, want to drive is really important. So I'll say that most of the time, uh, a data scientist workflow is, uh, spends a lot of it on feature engineering. And that's the process of taking raw data and um, uh, sending it, kind of applying it, uh, getting it ready for uh, machine learning models. So it can be a, a very complicated process uh, laborious, requires domain expertise. Um, I've got statistician friends who work on uh, missile systems reliability and nuclear warheads, um, right? You're dealing with data in that case with very small sample sizes with a uh, high uh, cost of failure, right? That's it's very different from the world that we live in, in marketing. So the kind of the feature engineering that they're doing is going to be very different than the feature engineering we're doing as we're trying to maximize these outcomes. So for marketers, what we find, uh, there are very two strong signals uh, in the data that we can extract. One is uh, behaviorals. So how are my customers engaging with my brand? And then what does that behavior tell me about what they're likely to do next? Are they likely to churn? Are they likely to upsell? Are they likely to register? Um, is there any signal at all? Have they completely fallen off the map? Um, those are the questions that the behavioral signal can help answer. And then we also have affinity signals. So that's really what customers are engaging with. And so when they're engaging with the brand, is that um, with content that my best customers are engaging with? Does a particular cu customer want more or less of uh, particular content? Um, and, and understanding those affinity signals help also drive and, and maximize these outcomes. So as you're starting to think about signal, um, answering the question of where do I start? Uh, this will go back to a little bit we talked about last time, which was starting with the low hanging data sources. And so those are gonna be things like web, mobile, uh, email, commerce ads. Those systems and those data sources are uh, first of all, the, lo the lowest hanging. And second of all, uh, a lot of the feature engineering for those processes has already been done. And if you're using a CDP like Lytics, those marketing signals are already encapsulated from, uh, from those data sources. But if you're not getting the mileage that you need, uh, you often will need to focus on integrating more custom sources. Um, and depending on really what you're trying to drive, uh, what kind of outcomes you're trying to drive, depends on if you need to bring that uh, data in in the first place and then what data you need, right? So um, I'll end with this. Um, caveat that you can't extract signal from data um, that doesn't have any signal, right? So if you're trying to predict if somebody's gonna purchase uh, a particular product, you need to have that purchase data in that system. Um, so if you don't have that purchase data, 
you're never going to be able to predict if somebody's going to make that purchase. For the most part, uh, these low-hanging data sources, web, mobile, email, commerce, ads, encapsulate most of the outcomes that we're trying to, to model and then most of the outcomes we're trying to maximize. And so if we need something else, we can integrate other customer data sources and start thinking about uh, feature engineering and extracting signal from those data sources. But uh, we can get started very quickly with some of these uh, kind of more low hanging and out of the box uh, data sources. So thanks for tuning in today. That was the right data gets results. And next time we'll be talking about uh, first party and third party data. Welcome back to the third installment of our marketing lessons from a data scientist. We're today going to be talking about third party data versus first party data. So uh, first party data typically is data that you own and represents data coming from uh, processes in your uh, pipeline in your marketing stack. So that can be uh, website traffic. Uh, if you have a mobile app, you know, can include that too. Uh, email engagement, customer service data, uh, point of sale transactions, anything that you uh, developed when in that in that relationship that you have with with your customer, that's going to to encapsulate what we call first party uh, data and first party data sources. Uh, third party data uh, kind of represents what uh, uh, where marketing has come from. Uh, you know, as we talked about in one of our other installments about marketing coming from. Uh, marketing personas and uh, direct mailings and times where you don't have uh, user level data about the, the customer that you're talking to. You know, if you're just sending a mailing out, you don't know necessarily who lives at this certain address. You're not personalizing what that, uh, what that mailing looks like. So you're kind of relying on aggregate data, which is what third party data often does. So you've got cookie pools. If you've seen lots of times uh, kind of uh, retargeting for things that you searched for uh, that are showing up in product recommendations on addressing. That's the reflection of uh, cookie sharing in kind of third-party cookie pools. Uh, you can also get third-party data from public data scraping, uh, online social profiles, what people are posting about um, on Twitter, that kind of thing. And you can also use uh, things like geolocation inference. I've seen products from companies that uh, use geolocation data to make a lot of inference about demographic data about um, a particular person. So, from your geo data, you can get a lot of information, right? I know where you live, I know where you work, I know what that says about what your income is likely to be, I know what that says about demographics and people who live where you live, um, and those kinds of things. And that that process is getting um, um, increasingly unstable, you know, from even a legal perspective. That uh, GDPR, CCPA, a lot of these uh, consent restrictions are uh, probably rightly restricting our ability to uh, use that third-party data. But as we're thinking about the things that we can do with first party data and the things that we can do with data, really where we're focusing on is first party data anyway. So I have some screenshots here from some playlists that Spotify made for me. Uh, the first one is a playlist called Thing The Ones That Got Away. So it's a collection of songs that Spotify thinks that um, I should have been listening to earlier. Right? It's, it's using the data that I have uh, generated inside of the Spotify platform from music that I'm listening to and making a personalized recommendation of songs that they think that I will like um, versus kind of a, a third party use case where in this case, this is uh, top uh, 50 kind of charts from the United States. It's using aggregate data based on the fact that they know I live in the United States to build a playlist of things that people in the United States are listening to. And so if you think about these two playlists, uh, there's probably one that I'm much more likely to listen to than the other. Right, I'm much more likely to listen to this first party case that's uh, generated based off of recommendations of things that I'm interested in uh, versus this third party case of things that you know, I might be interested in, but, but you don't really know. So these extracting the information from our first party sources is going to power the kinds of personalization that we really want to drive. Here's an example of some first party data extraction from inside uh, of Lytics. This is my own personal profile inside Lytics. So it's the data that Lytics has collected on me on Lytics uh, marketing sites. And so you know, based off of my engagement here, um, that I'm interested in customer data platforms and data and data science personalization, 
those kinds of things. And I'm also uh, engaging uh, pretty heavily um, uh, with that site. So, so that all makes sense, right? If you are using um, your web data, if you're using your email data, you know, in a way that's really powering personalization, it'll probably look a lot like this. And so you wanna make sure that um, when you're incorporating your first party data, that you're capturing signals that are helping you drive that personalization that you're, you're looking to do. And a, a customer data platform or an intelligent platform like Lytics that helps extract those signals from that first party data is going to get you there faster. So that's what we have for today. Uh, thanks for tuning in again, and we will see you in our next installment.